Hey, Humo soldiers. Some of you are interested in scoring some Humo merch, like t-shirts and hoodies, but you don't want to wait to win a contest to get it. I get it. I have now set up an online store if you want to purchase one of those items. Check the liner notes for this episode to get the link. Thank you again to those of you who have joined Supporting Cast, the Apple subscription option, and the Patreon. The Patreon link is www.patreon.com slash leader1, L-E-A-D-E-R-O-N-E. Like with Supporting Cast and the Apple subscription, Patreon donors will get early releases, bonus episodes, and an entry in the monthly draws for merch. Remember, there is no minimum donation for the Patreon. If a dollar is all you can swing, it would be greatly appreciated. Thank you so much for listening and for your support. Enjoy the show. Welcome to Human Monsters. June 10th, 1985, Washington County, Nebraska. The Sheriff's Department contacted a social worker representing the Nebraska Department of Social Services regarding the care of Sean, Sally, and Steve MacArthur. They were foster children with Jarrett and Barbara Webb as their caretakers in the township of Fort Calhoun. This is the text of the social worker's report. The sheriff's department phoned today and stated they had the MacArthur children in their custody and they had picked them up from the Webb home due to child abuse complaint. Sean had welts and scratches over parts of his back which he said the Webbs had beat him with a railroad iron and belt. They also had picked up the Webbs' son, Joey, age 16. Joey also complained of being beaten by his parents. Sean said the Webbs have been beating them for quite some time, and this is not the first time this has happened to them. They were afraid to say anything the other times. Jarrett Webb worked for the Omaha Public Power District, and was a member of the board of the Franklin Community Federal Credit Union, whose head was Lawrence E. King, Jr. Barbara Webb is King's cousin. Sean MacArthur and foster son Joey Patterson were both removed from their custody that month. They frequently had as many as nine foster children in their home at a time. Many of them would run away, some in pairs, and others on their own. In August, Joey's sister, 14-year-old Kimberly Patterson Webb, and brother Michael ran away, though they were later returned to the Webb residence. In November of that year, 16-year-old Nellie Patterson Webb ran away to the home of her grandmother, Ruby Patterson. Needless to say, there was a pattern of child abuse in their home that exceeded each child's threshold of endurance. December 18, 1985. The Fremont Office of the Department of Social Services reported more details on the circumstances that led to these children fleeing their foster home in search of a refuge from abuse. Our office and a deputy interviewed Kimberly, who had obtained permission to visit Nellie at their grandmother's, and Nellie separately and together. Both girls stated numerous times that they refused to go back to the webs. Both girls have stated they have received quote-unquote whippings and quote-unquote beatings from both Barbara and Jarrett at different times. These started in 1978, approximately eight months after they moved into the web home. The girls said they were hit with objects, an extension cord, a belt, a uh, black thing as they put it, rubber hose, 
and a railroad prop, a narrow piece of heavy black rubber approximately two feet long with several holes in each end. Before they were struck, they were made to remove their clothing. They were mainly struck on the back or on the behind, but occasionally on the head or face. Social workers removed Nellie, full name Cornelia M. Patterson Webb, from the Webb home. She was transferred to another foster home, that of Ron and Kathleen Sorensen in Blair, Nebraska. After the move, Nellie was interviewed by State Patrol Investigator Jane F. Tooley of the Washington County Sheriff's Office. More disturbing details of the abuse Nellie suffered at the Webb House came to light in the following report, dated January 30, 1986. She stated that she had been sexually abused. Nellie stated that when she was approximately 9 or 10 years of age, that Jarrett Webb kissed her for a long time, and that she pulled away because she couldn't breathe, and it was nasty. She stated that it, he was French kissing her, and she stated that he was slobbering in her mouth. Nellie stated again that when she was approximately 9 or 10 years old, that on one occasion, Jarrett Webb made her take a nap with him in his bed, and she stated, quote, He played with all my body parts. He touched her vagina, and that he put his finger inside her vagina. Nellie stated that when she was 10 and 11 years old, at nighttime, when everyone was in bed, Jarrett Webb called her into his room a couple of times. When she didn't come into the room, he then told her to come in or he would whip her. She stated that Jarrett Webb pulled the sheet down and pulled her on top of him. She stated that she could feel his hair against her leg and knew that he didn't have any underwear on. Nellie told Tooley that when she was 15, Jarrett punished her for some transgression by ordering her to undress and lie on the bed. He beat her with a rubber strap as she lay in the nude, face up. He told her to lie on her back and put her legs in the air. He pressed himself between her legs and began to hump her. He beat her with the strap again. He turned her back over and sucked on her breasts. Nellie began to cry. Jarrett left soon after. February 1986. The Department of Social Services ordered the immediate and emergency removal of Kendra and Michael Webb from the Webb home. Among their concerns were the following. Repeated allegations of physical abuse told to our department by six children during separate interviews. A. Of being struck for long periods of time while naked by various objects, including a belt, rubber hose, and the railroad prop. B. Denial of meals in the home. 3. Sexual abuse of Nellie by Jarrett, supported by a polygraph test given to Nellie on January 30, 1986. 4. The intense concern by the children out of the Webb home for the physical and emotional well-being of the children remaining in the home. According to DSS memos, the Webbs were in a big hurry to terminate their adoptive parent status of Nellie and Kimberly. This initiative followed closely on the heels of Nellie's departure in November 1985. They did this because they knew it would limit the reach of the investigation of the abuse allegations. Reversing adoptions is not a routine procedure. To quote one DSS social worker, Regarding a relinquishment of adopted children, the department does not accept one easily. The Webbs could not be dissuaded, however. Indeed, Barbara Webb approached the agency in January 1986 and unleashed a firestorm of hysteria to escalate the process. As social workers noted, she was, quote, crying and carrying on. 
She was asking about the allegations made by the girls and wanted to get the relinquishment process over with. The Webbs were represented by attorney Gary Randall, brother of Casey Randall, who was involved in some capacity with Larry King's Franklin Credit Union. Nellie and Kimberly understood that situation enough to refer to Casey as, quote, Larry's maid. Gary Randall approached the relinquishment with the assistance of an official that would normally have initiated litigation against the Webbs for child abuse. That official was Washington County Prosecutor Patrick Tripp. June 1986. The Webbs were punished by the state for the record of child abuse by having their foster care license suspended. Patrick Tripp decided against filing abuse charges against the Webbs. There were additional allegations, those involving the production of child pornography and child sex trafficking, but instead of ordering an investigation and bringing more charges to bear, Patrick Tripp called Nellie a liar. This, despite the fact that she passed four polygraph examinations. Despite the effort to protect the webs from prosecution and keep the case out of earshot of the media and the public, Patrick Tripp's handling of the case did not go unnoticed by onlookers. Julie Walters, a youth care worker, placed a phone call to Nellie and Kimberly Patterson Webb in March 1986. Both girls were privy to the abuse of boys who resided at an orphanage called Boys Town which is located just west of Omaha. Julie Walters worked at Boys Town. In her report, Patrick Tripp's role in the girls' lives was noted as being adversarial. The following is a sample from the 50-page report. When presented with Jane Tooley's investigation, Pat Tripp, the Washington County Prosecutor, said he didn't believe Nellie and wanted her to take a polygraph test. At his request, Nellie was given four polygraph tests administered by a state trooper at the State Patrol Office on Center Street in Omaha. The state trooper, after Nellie's testing was completed, told Kathleen Sorensen he tried to, quote, break Nellie down, but he was convinced she was telling the truth. He also told Nellie that she passed and that he believed her. Although the polygraph tests showed Nellie was not deceptive, attorney Pat Tripp maintained he still didn't believe what Nellie said. He said Nellie had fantasized these stories to the point that she believed they were true. Tripp's notion that child abuse victims in Nebraska fabricated their abuse stories and therefore they needn't be investigated would echo throughout law enforcement agencies and social services departments for as long as the Franklin case persisted. Tripp was a close friend of two people who were indicated by Kimberly Webb and Nellie as being involved with the Webbs. One was Fort Calhoun Superintendent of Schools, Dewart Finch, and Fort Calhoun High School Principal, Kent Miller. Thanks to Patrick Tripp, the Webbs dodged a DSS investigation and criminal prosecution. Following his refusal to charge the couple, Tripp resigned from his position as Washington County Prosecutor and went on to work as a prominent lawyer in Omaha. Larry King of the Credit Union factored into another section of Julie Walters' report, an excerpt. While the Webbs were away, the kids snooped through the house. They found one pornographic videotapes in a bag under the Webb's bed, which the kids played on the VCR while Webb's were gone, one tape specifically showing teenagers involved in sexual activity. Nellie and Kimberly knew from eavesdropping that Larry King supplied the Webb's with the videotapes. Two, pornographic magazines in the basement. Once, when Sean was suspected of snooping around in the magazines, he was not allowed to eat anything at the Webb's house for one week. Three, 
box of a lot of quote-unquote romantic novels in Mrs. Webb's closet, i.e. mothers having sex with their sons. Four, stacks of 8x10 photo envelopes marked Do Not Bend in Mrs. Webb's closet. Five, photos of naked white women in Webb's bedroom dresser drawer. Walters also noted that the Webbs lived extravagantly. Other people were involved in their activities, including Larry King. A quote, Although at the March 7, 1986 hearing, Mr. Webb stated that he earns $32,000 a year, the Webb's home is furnished quite expensively. $2,000 paintings, crystal, silver, several VCRs, TVs, etc., also, Mrs. Webb wears a four-carat diamond ring, a full-length fur coat, all custom-made dresses, expensive accessories. When they throw a party, it includes caterers and limousines. Larry King attends meetings and parties at the Omaha Girls Club about every other week. He sometimes invited Joey Webb or Nellie by calling the Webbs and telling them to have one of the kids ready in so many minutes. Nellie said they had no choice about attending these functions. She said she intended only once about two years ago, age 14, but Joey attended regularly from the time he was in 7th grade, approximately age 12 to 13, until he left the Webbs' home, age 16. When Nellie attended, she and Larry King went alone in his limo. Other times, Mrs. King and Mr. and Mrs. Webb also attended. Nellie described these functions as lasting about 45 minutes. She said she attended one held on a Friday evening about 7 p.m. There were about 10 to 15 older men present and about 25 young teenage girls there. The girls all signed a brown notebook Larry King had. Nellie has appeared very frightened and teared up when asked about the document. Larry King either called or sent invitations to Nellie, Kimberly, and Joey to attend parties at his home, which are held about every other week. This began about two years ago. Again, Nellie said the kids had no choice about whether or not they would attend. They were driven over to King's with Mr. and Mrs. Webb, Nellie and Kimberly said they talked with boys at those parties, who said they were from Boys Town. From Boys Town yearbook photos, after examining 83, 84, and 85 yearbooks, Kimberly said four boys had all attended some of Larry's parties during the summers of 84 and 85. Nellie was afraid to mention any names, but earlier had mentioned a Brent, whose picture she didn't find in the yearbooks, who told her he had left Boys Town in 84. Brent was flown to another city somewhere in Larry's private plane to work for someone else after he and Larry had a disagreement. At the parties, there are usually about 30 adults present, male and females, more white than black guests, because according to Larry, Blacks get ignorant when they drink and tighter with their money, and whites spend more money when they're drunk. Also present were some prostitutes, ages unknown but not teenagers, and unnamed persons, ages 16 to 22, and Nellie and Kimberly, about 20 kids total. If a man was interested in a young lady, he held out a folded 50 or $100 bill in front of them and whispered something in her ear. Then they went upstairs or to some other area of the house. Nellie and Kimberly said the prostitutes told them they gave half of the money they got to Larry King. Larry also gave some of the boys at these parties new cars. The sexual activity was not always behind closed doors or confined to the upstairs rooms and sometimes involved more than two people. Couples engaged in sexual activity were same-sex as well as opposite sex. The money Joey told Nellie and Kimberly he made working for Larry, the Webbs took from him supposedly to keep for him. Walters detailed Larry King's ability to command minors to obey him. 
Larry claims to donate money to Boys Town and be on the board of directors at Girls Club. Nellie said Larry has gotten Boys Town boys and other boys to his home by asking them to do some yard work. If Larry asks the young man to do something and he refuses, Larry might hit him. Nellie said Larry has a bad temper. Larry also tells the young men they'll get hurt. Nellie also accompanied Mr. and Mrs. King and their son Prince on trips to Chicago, New York, and Washington, D.C., beginning when she was 15 years old. She missed 22 days of school, almost totally due to these trips. Nellie was taken along on the pretense of being Prince's babysitter. Last year, she met Vice President George H.W. Bush and saw him again at one of the parties Larry gave while on a Washington, D.C. trip. At some of the parties, there are just men, as was the case at the party George Bush attended, older men and younger men in their early 20s. Nellie said she has seen sodomy committed at those parties. At other parties during Larry's trips, Larry had local prostitutes in their 20s and 30s there to entertain his male guests. At these parties, Nellie said every guest had a bodyguard and she saw some of the men wearing guns. All guests had to produce a card which was run through a machine to verify the guest was, in fact, who they said they were. And then each guest was frisked down before entering the party. Walters asked the girls about the staff of Boys Town. Some quotes from this portion of the interview. If you mess with him, you'll get your legs broken. On the outside, he has all the appearances of an upstanding citizen. But underneath, he is very dirty. Omaha has a very large underworld, and he's a very powerful man nationally. Maybe he doesn't have all the connections personally, but he knows the people who do. King used to be very active in Big Brothers and took more than an appropriate interest in the young men. Walters also documented her findings on Fort Calhoun school officials Deward Finch and Kent Miller, both quote-unquote good friends of Patrick Tripp. Finch was later reported to be an associate of Larry King. From Walters' report, Kimberly overheard Mrs. Webb tell someone on the phone, I got Finch all the way. I caught him several times down there with black girls. Nellie saw Mr. Finch leave the Webb home once as she returned home from school, and Kimberly saw him leave the Webb house several times during daytime hours. Kimberly's first period class at school is a study hall, which is located across the hall from the school's office. She said Mr. Finch would regularly call the Webbs and say, It's time for another meeting. Mr. Finch would interrupt whatever he was doing when the Webbs arrived to meet with them, meeting in the school office, sometimes for several hours. At some meetings, Kent Miller, principal at Fort Calhoun High School, was also present. Mrs. Webb almost always carried a large Gucci bag, almost the size of a shopping bag, with her into these meetings. Kimberly said Mrs. Webb carried some photo envelopes from Mrs. Webb's closet with her at least once into these meetings, telling Kimberly she was going to show Mr. Miller pictures from their trip. Julie Walters submitted a report to all relevant law enforcement agencies by March 1986. The DSS logs were also available for consulting. The law enforcement agencies did not investigate the findings in the reports. Had they done so, they could have eliminated a syndicate of child sexual slavery. While police and related agents procrastinated, the trail went cold. Any member of that syndicate who would have been aware of the investigation, and they were legion, would have had time to cover their tracks and recalibrate to prevent exposure and prosecution. They did exactly that. Larry King was invited back to sing the Star-Spangled Banner at the Republican National Convention in 1988, as he had been 
1984. May 5, 1988, Margot Georgiou and her 17-year-old daughter, Brenda Parker, filed a complaint about an Omaha-based photographer. His name is Rusty Nelson, and the charge filed with the Omaha Police Department was logged as, quote, possible child pornography. According to police records, Nelson approached Brenda at the store where she worked as a cashier. He told her he was, quote, doing some photographic work for the Easter Seals campaign. He gave her his business card, which described him as, quote, Rusty Nelson, the cameraman, creative photography. She eventually called him, and he told her he was photographing redheads like her for his European portfolio. He mentioned that were she to take the job, she would pose in swimsuits and lingerie. She asked him if she could bring her mother to the shoot, and he said yes. Officer Earl Carmian interviewed mother and daughter about what transpired during the five-hour session in the Twin Towers. From Carmian's report, Nelson took several photographs of Parker in various types of clothing, although no swimsuits or lingerie were worn. Brenda stated that Nelson repeatedly made references to Parker in her birthday suit and making her breasts look bigger. Nelson never specifically asked Parker to pose nude or semi-nude, but did try to get her to show as much skin as possible and also try to make Parker show as much cleavage as possible. Repeatedly, Nelson tried to persuade Parker to model in lingerie as well as a form of clothing known as teddies. Parker indicated she refused to do this. During the course of the photographic session, Parker's mother, Margot Georgiou, looked at several photographs which were scattered about the apartment and apparently taken by Nelson. Margot Georgiou stated that she observed several photographs of nude females ranging in age, in her estimation, from 20 years old to as young as possibly 12. Several of the females in the photographs showed frontal nudity. Suspicious about the creative photography setup, Margot Georgiou phoned around to various modeling agencies and schools in Omaha, to which Nelson had claimed he supplied pictures. No one there had heard of him, with the exception of a man at one agency who called Nelson a pervert and warned Georgiou to keep her daughter away from him. That's when she called the police. Brenda Parker indicated that she suspected Nelson to be a homosexual. Parker identified Nelson as being a white male, approximately 25 years old, 5'9", 140 pounds with dishwater blonde hair and a small blonde mustache. He was casually dressed and appeared quite feminine. During their conversation, Parker stated that Nelson said that he does work at Max which is a gay bar located in downtown Omaha, and he further stated that he frequents gay bars. Parker stated that Nelson continually offered various foods and drink to both Parker and her mother. Nelson placed a very large bowl of strawberries on a table, offering them to Brenda and her mother. They were also offered to drink some champagne. During the conversation, Nelson stated that he was self-employed, but made a couple of references to, quote-unquote, the boss, keeping the place well-stocked, and that the boss let him stay there rent-free. It is unknown who the boss is. The police officer dispatched to investigate Nelson's studio soon learned that the so-called boss was Larry King. An excerpt from the officer's report. On Wednesday, the 25th of May, 1988, reporting officer Michael Hotch went to the Twin Towers, 2900 Farnham Street, and spoke with the owner-operator of the Twin Tower Complex. He indicated that a party by the name of Rusty Nelson, who is occupying apartment 3B, which was leased to Larry King, has since moved out of the apartment complex. Nelson vacated the unit on May 14th, nine days after George U and Brenda filed their complaint. It came to light that Larry King rented a luxury penthouse in the building. From the officer's report, 
Since King has rented the apartment in August 1987, the manager believed that he has possibly put $50,000 into the apartment in such things as decorating, drapes, and furnishings. He went on to state that he had bought a couch from one of the furniture dealers in Omaha that would not fit in the elevator as it was being transported to King's apartment. And as a result of this, a crane was rented for the amount of $1,200 to have the couch lifted to the apartment from the outside. He also stated that the apartment was very elegantly furnished and the $50,000 outlay would not include what he described as original paintings, along with what is believed to be possibly a solid silver chair. He also stated that he knows that King drives at least five different vehicles, three of the vehicles being Mercedes Benzes, one being a Cadillac Alante, and the other being some type of sports car. He also stated that he believes that King owns properties in Washington, D.C. He went on to state that King has a habit of throwing names around, and it is believed he is very influential in the Republican Party. He also indicated that he does not understand how King has as much money as he does to spend. King does not actually live at the penthouse apartment in the Twin Towers, but uses the apartment for parties and occasionally stays at the apartment. He stated that he had talked to a realtor who indicated that King apparently attempted to purchase a residence approximately five years ago and, at that time, had trouble coming up with a down payment for the house. It seemed strange to him that in five years, King had come into as much money as he spends. At a neighboring complex, the Orpheum Tower, Officer Hotch learned that tenant Larry King sublet an apartment to a young man who was a disc jockey at the Max Bar. King had told the building manager that he was renting the apartment as a place to stay when he worked late so that he didn't have to travel out to a suburban home. Hotch asked the Orpheum manager if she knew any particulars or had any type of information about Larry King, as it seemed very strange that he would rent an apartment in the Orpheum Tower and is presently renting an apartment at the Twin Towers. She indicated that she did not know any specifics about Larry King. However, she has stated that she has heard rumors that he is a very heavy drug dealer and that she has heard this from more than one individual. She stated that she has also heard that Larry King is a homosexual and has a preference of young men or boys. The OPD ceased its probe of Rusty Nelson, his pornography operation, and his alleged boss. June 28, 1988. Earl Carmian was dispatched to interview another girl. She was 15-year-old Omaha resident Loretta Smith. She was in hospital at the time. She told a therapist about, according to Carmian's report, incidents in which she had been photographed nude or partially nude, as well as instances of devil worship. Smith initiated the conversation by indicating that approximately five or six years ago, when she was nine years old, she went to a party with some friends much older than her. There, she met a white male who coaxed her into modeling for him. He offered to take Smith home if Smith would pose for some pictures. Initially, the unidentified white male took photographs of her with a Polaroid camera, of her fully clothed, although finally, she agreed to pose for one completely nude photograph taken by this white male. Smith then spoke of occasions when she went to the North Omaha Girls Club on Lake Street with friends of hers whom she identified as Nellie and Kimberly Webb. There, she discovered that they were also modeling. Smith stated that those field trips consisted of the girls being taken to a photographic studio where pictures were taken of them either nude or partially clad. Smith also stated that she has not spoken to or knows the whereabouts of either Nellie or Kimberly Webb, not having seen them for approximately three years. She stated that a number of adults, whom she referred to as leaders from the North Omaha Girls Club, both male and female, were engaged in the photography of nude children. 
She also indicated that a number of prominent individuals were involved, including doctors and lawyers, although she indicated they used code names and that she could provide no real names for these individuals. Smith also indicated that the adult leaders who took these photographs used threats against her and others to get them to participate in these photographic sessions. She stated that she had been told on occasion that her entire family would be killed as well as her if she refused to participate in these activities. As for the devil worship, it involved both minors and adults. She was between 10 and 11 years old when she began attending satanic rituals. Posing nude for photographs was often a feature of these ceremonies. Participants were made to drink a beverage that tasted like apple juice and contained some kind of narcotic. More from Carmian's report. Smith indicated that Nellie and Kimberly Webb had also reported these activities to police in the past, but that nothing had been done. She stated that the Webb girls had told the superintendent of Fort Calhoun schools, whom she identified as a Mr. Finch, and stated that it had been reported to him at first, but the girls felt that since nothing was done, that he must have been involved also. June 30th, 1988. Carmian documented more of Loretta's allegations. During the course of reporting officer's interview with Loretta Isabel Smith concerning child pornography activity, as well as devil worship, she mentioned the name of Larry King as being a participant and supporter in these activities. Asked how she knew this, Smith stated that she is a friend of the daughter of Gary West. West is reportedly the manager for Max's, a predominantly homosexual bar located south of Central Station at 1415 Jackson Street. Smith stated that she has been to the West residence several times and that Gary West is a homosexual as well as an alcoholic. She stated that when he does become intoxicated, he talks about his certain activities with Larry King and indicated that he is into the use of controlled substances i.e. cocaine, for personal use as well as for sale, and that he owes Larry King a lot of money for this. With regard to Larry King, she stated that she knows that he supports devil worship activities. She further indicated that King owns a house on Wirt Street, the exact location of which she did not know, but that King holds various drug and sex parties there. Smith initially told reporting officer that she had been to the Wirt house on one occasion in which she saw three or four teenage males engaged in oral copulation. It became apparent when Smith began talking about King and West with a lack of specificity that she didn't wish to go into much detail with reporting officer at this time. Reporting officer told her to consider recalling as much information as possible and that she and reporting officer would talk again at a later date. July 5th, Loretta called Officer Carmian and gave him the address and phone number of Larry King's house on Wirt Street. When Carmian called the number, the opening salutation was King Company. The name King was printed in black script lettering on an awning in front of the building. Later in 1988, Loretta Smith grew to trust the staff at Richard Young Hospital. She felt secure enough to reveal more about what she and the other child victims had been through. The report was submitted to the Franklin Committee by Jerry Lowe in 1989. From the report, Loretta provided additional information of her previous involvement in cult activity, which included the witnessing of homicides of several young children and which also included references to Larry King and others involved in the cult activities. August 19, 1988, the hospital notes indicated that Loretta was asked to give a chronological account of involvement in what is described as a devil worship cult, and that Loretta agreed to do this. Loretta indicated that she didn't really know what was happening, and that she became involved very gradually. She indicated that when she was approximately nine years old, 
she was going to the girls' club in Omaha and that a guy named Ray would take her and four or five other girls at the girls' club on outings. He took them to a building that, according to Loretta, looked abandoned and asked the girls if they wanted to go in, which they all agreed to do. Loretta indicated they sat and talked for a while, and then Ray provided a joint and all of the individuals got high. She indicated this activity continued for about three or four weeks, and then Ray took them to a party. Loretta indicated that at the party, there were about ten men, all of them in their mid-thirties, and that initially they sat around and talked with the girls about their problems. Loretta indicated that all the people got wasted, and that the men at the party made them sleep around, and that the girls did not have a choice of who they slept with. Loretta stayed away from the girls' club after this for a few days, but then in order to get out of the house, she did begin going to the parties again, and they lasted for another six months. On one occasion, she threatened to tell her mother that the men were having sex with her, and that they knew she was only nine, but the men indicated that they would kill anyone who told about the activities. The men started taking the girls to what the men described as power meetings. Loretta advised she was 10 years old. She indicated that candles and other weird stuff were at the power meetings. According to Loretta, one of the individuals on one occasion told the girls that the room was going to spin for a while. And it did. And she realized later that it was drugs that the men had given them. Loretta advised that about eight months later, she was put through her first test. Her and the other girls were taken to a building in Omaha where she was locked in a room with a little girl, which she described as a Caucasian infant. At about midnight, Loretta indicated that the men came into the room, took the little girl away from her, and told her that she could achieve power by killing something that she really loved. Loretta described that they then cut the little girl's head off, stuck it on the wall, and made her sit in front of it. Loretta indicated later she had to take the head off the wall and that the men held her down while they cut the eyes out of the little girl's head. They then left Loretta and the girl in the room, locking the door. She was left in the locked room with the little girl for 24 hours, and during this time, she could hear another one of the girls screaming. She could hear the men whipping and beating the girl. Shortly after this, the men came into the room and told Loretta that she had passed the test and then drove her a couple of blocks from her house and let her out. Loretta indicated the next time that she saw the men she had gone to a friend's house who was having a party and the men showed up. Loretta identified two of the men as Larry King and a Mr. Finch who Loretta indicated was a school principal. Additionally, she identified parties as Ace, King Horace, Jerry Lucifer, and Mike. After one such party, Loretta said another girl called OPD and reported that she was raped and tried to press charges. Other girls covered up the rape for the men. Loretta indicated that she again threatened to tell about the activities and the men said they would kill her or her mother. At another meeting, Loretta indicated devil worshipping was practiced and that another small boy was sacrificed. Loretta and the other girls were in the other room and she could hear the little boy screaming. She then indicated the child was fried and eaten by the girls. Loretta indicated she refused to take part in this so that the men beat her for two days. At additional meetings, Loretta indicated the men told her and the other girls that they must sacrifice for power, and described three incidents where further sacrifices took place. The first, a one-year-old white female had her head taken off by a saw. The second, a four-year-old white male was hung on the wall and darts thrown at him. And the third, an Indian female, three or four years old, had several parts of her body cut off, after which it was ground and poured on the girls and they also were made to drink the remains of the child. August 21, 1988, 
Loretta indicated the third, fourth, and fifth sacrifices took place during the spring of 1985, when she was 11, and that the parties that were at these sacrifices were Mr. Finch, King, Horses, and the big guy she referred to earlier. Between the sacrifices, she indicated that the girls were tested to see if they would keep quiet and how much control that the men had over them. Loretta indicated that the men would try to scare the girls by having them watch as animals were mutilated, and also the men would threaten them by saying that instead of killing them, that they would just cut off parts of bodies and torture the girls and make them suffer. Asked to provide details relative to the first sacrifice of the infant girl, Loretta indicated that at first she didn't cry, and after this the men cut the eyes out of the girl. Loretta indicated that she freaked out, was screaming, and hitting the walls. She said the cult members were wearing what she described as clothes, which had upside-down crosses on them, and that the leader always wore a long black cape with gold rings shaped like a skeleton head. Loretta went into the Emanuel Hospital for the first time in November of 1985, and also was in Emanuel in January of 1986 and March of 1986. Then her mother put her in the court system so that she could ultimately get her into Uda Haley, a school and residence for troubled girls. Foster Care Review Board Executive Director Carol Stitt considered Loretta's testimony to be highly credible. On December 19, 1988, she presented her findings to the legislature's executive board. She said, One of the things that you want to keep in mind as horrifying as this is when you review it. This girl is very concrete about who was present at these homicides, what was happening, dates. She gave a lot of specific information. And in working with children, one of the ways you know this is not a global fantasy is the more details they give you. Much of the information provided by Loretta Smith overlapped with intel that was gathered by Omaha police and from victims of the Webbs and Rusty Nelson. Three cases backed by evidence were converging and heading in Larry King's direction. July 1988, the OPD's robbery and sex unit received a visit from their boss, Chief of Police Robert Wadman. According to Nebraska Foster Care Review Board official Dennis Carlson, from when he testified before the legislature's executive board, the officers took precautions to conceal their Larry King-related work. December 19, 1988. Dennis Carlson made remarks to the legislature executive board to the effect that the officers feared that a cover-up of King's illicit activities was afoot within the department. A portion from Carlson's address... Officer Carmian told me some things which I found to be somewhat startling. I asked if he was interested in information regarding Larry King, and he said, Yes, we are. We're conducting what he called a supersensitive investigation of Larry King, and he said this investigation was so supersensitive that they were not even using the Steno pool in the Omaha Police Department. They were handwriting their police reports. And he also told me that Chief Wadman had come to their unit and directly asked if they were investigating Larry King. Investigator Carmian told me, we lied to the chief and we said, no, we are not investigating Larry King. Okay, so that conversation took place on July 20th of 1988. After we were presented with that information, we had some concerns as to what was going on in the Omaha Police Department. We were concerned about if we gave this information to the Omaha Police Department, what would they do with it? The allegations made by Loretta Smith did not result in a lengthy investigation. June 28, 1988. Immediately following Officer Carmian's interview with Loretta Smith, his supervisor, Sergeant Ken Bovasso, spoke with one Dr. K. Schilling over the telephone. Schilling was Loretta's psychiatrist at the hospital. Bovasso's report. 
Schilling told this reporting officer that she has spoken with Loretta Smith since Loretta's discussion with Officer Carmian. Loretta told Dr. Schilling that she only gave Officer Carmian general information, but that she had no problem talking with Officer Carmian. Reporting officer told Dr. Schilling that sometime during the week of July 4th, 1988, this reporting officer will assign Officer Carmian to revisit Loretta at the hospital in order to build up some rapport and possibly obtain more specific information. This marked the last occasion when Loretta was interviewed by Officer Carmian. Throughout the summer, Loretta reported more information, much of it horrific. Hospital staff and other individuals overlooking Loretta's care were alarmed and appalled by the lack of interest from police. To quote Dennis Carlson from his executive board summary, Loretta was making more allegations against Larry King and others, and these were allegations of the most serious nature. She was reporting that she had witnessed homicides. Investigator Carmian was contacted by myself on one, possibly two or three occasions. I'd tell him that this one of my telephone conversations with Investigator Carmian, I remember telling him that this girl was now reporting homicides. And he said, yes, I need to get out there and re-interview this girl. One of my concerns, Senator, is the conduct of the Omaha Police Department. I don't know what's going on up there. I'm not familiar with the players in the Omaha Police Department, but I know that I hand-delivered material to an investigator. Investigator Carmian and Investigator Hotch left my office, and they seemed sincere. They seemed that they were going to investigate these allegations. And later, it was as if air had been let out of a balloon that all of a sudden they had no interest in even re-interviewing a girl who was saying that she had witnessed homicides. And I just don't understand it. FCRB Executive Director Carol Stitz remarks, I would like to add something that was highly unusual in this case. Loretta's psychiatrist contacted the police in Omaha and asked them to come. Loretta's personal care worker, Ken Stoner, contacted the police. Richard Young employee Kirsten Hallberg contacted the police, as well as Adrian Hart, who was Kirsten's supervisor. All those people had made contact, and nothing was done. Shortly after Officer Carmian's interview with Loretta, he was transferred out of investigations into a department called Research and Planning. It's like being a partner in a law firm and then being demoted to document review. At the executive board meeting, Senator Ernie Chambers recalled a conversation with Carmian. When I called the sexual assault unit, they said he's no longer here. And that's when they told me that he was with research and planning. I finally got him and I mentioned his enthusiasm at the outset. And that from what I had developed in terms of creditable information being given to me, I felt he'd been transferred because he was getting too close to something, and his superiors did not want him to continue. So there was a silence. Then he kind of chuckled. He said, well, no, uh, I wanted this transfer. I've known of Carmian for years, and he's not the type of officer who'd want to be put into an office where he's the only one there. In fact, that might have been the creation of the department. Didn't even have a secretary. Carmian testified before the Legislative Franklin Committee in June 1989 that though he was removed from the case, he found Loretta's claims to be credible and deserved a follow-up. July 5th, 1989. Chief Wadman tried to have Carmian declared insane. In a document entitled, Inter-Office Communication, sent to Omaha Public Safety Director Pittman Foxall, who happened to be one of Larry King's cousins, Wadman called for a mental health evaluation to be performed on Earl Carmian. From Wadman's Communique. 
I am requesting a supervisory referral for Officer Earl Carmian to see police psychologist Dr. Stephen Sheritz. I am basing this request on the actions demonstrated by Officer Carmian that surfaced during the Larry King investigation. Prior to Officer Carmian's assignment with research and planning, he was serving as an investigator with the Robbery and Sex Unit under the command of Lieutenant Guy Goodrich. While on that assignment, Officer Carmian was involved as an investigator and did participate in looking into matters involving allegations that Larry King was involved in some sexual improprieties with young people. The investigation never did come close to supporting the allegations sufficiently for a charge to be considered against Larry King. OPD Officer Bill Skoleski kept a file on Larry King, but that last vestige of hope died along with him when he perished from a heart attack. August 1989 Chief Wadman officially dismissed the allegations made by Loretta Smith and the other children about the abuses they suffered at the hands of Larry King and his cronies. On a radio program, he chalked up the concerns that had been raised in the light of the allegations that surfaced to, quote, prurient interest of child abuse, of child sexual abuse, those kinds of things. I think that the media attention to that element of things is inappropriate. Commenting on Loretta Smith specifically, he said, The primary witness was making statements that were very bizarre and were not founded in reality. He concluded by saying that the investigations led to a dead end. Of course, he failed to mention that he was among the engineers of the cul-de-sac in question. Robert Wadman stated under oath that he barely knew Larry King and that he, quote, had very few social contacts with Larry King. In an interview with both King and Wadman on April 22, 1989, Frank Brown of TV7 Omaha asked them about an incident when Wadman intervened in a legal matter at King's request. He asked him to release a suitcase from evidence that was seized in a drug raid. The exchange went as follows. Brown. King acknowledges he is a friend of Chief Wadman's. We asked King, did he call the chief to get a suitcase released that had been seized in a drug investigation? You had that friendship where you could, King, yes. Brown. You could call the chief of police and get a piece of evidence released? King. I felt that I could call anyone in this city. Brown. What was that suitcase? I've always wondered what was in that suitcase and what was it about. King. Um, it's really nothing. It was a relative of mine and he was staying in a hotel and I guess they had a drug bust or something. Brown. We asked Chief Robert Wadman if Larry King had ever telephoned him to get a suitcase released from police custody. Wadman. Yes, I can't recall if it was this past year or the year before that he did call regarding a situation and that information was forwarded to the unit responsible for the request. Brown. That did not compromise any investigation? Wadman. Absolutely not. And I'm very disappointed that this situation continues to be protractive, but it was a situation that was routinely handled. I received literally hundreds of those requests, and this situation was handled exactly the same way as the rest. Brown to King. The Omaha police had an investigation last summer into an alleged pornographic King. Uh-huh. Brown. And you were cleared? King. I didn't even know that they had one last summer. People make up these things. People make up anything. You can hear anything about anyone. If you choose to believe it, you will. If you choose not to, you don't. I choose not to listen to garbage and gossip. Larry King was cleared with the blessing of Robert Wadman. The Legislative Franklin Committee's record of Wadman's testimony regarding that development dates from October 13, 1989. The other speakers in the following transcript excerpt 
are committee counsel John Stevens Barry and Robert Krieger. Wadman's lawyer Kent Winery also weighed in. Barry, are you aware whether or not there have been any ongoing investigations in Omaha regarding whether or not Mr. King has been involved with narcotics? Winery, may I just ask a point of clarification? Are you talking about ongoing or but not concluded or Barry? Well, I suppose I could ask a series of questions. Have there been in the past? Have there been any continuing? Have there been any ongoing at all? Do you know anything about Mr. King or has Mr. King been a subject of a narcotics investigation? That's an area I want the chief to address and I'm happy to have him address it. Wadman. I'm unaware of any of those. Krieger. The answer is no. Wadman. The answer is no. Yeah. Barry. Let me ask the very same broad question about Mr. King and the relationship to child pornography or pornography of any kind. Wadman. We had a situation where we were advised that there was a possibility of child pornography involving... No, it came in as child pornography case. What happened is that there was a photographer who was taking photographs of young women, and in the course of that set of circumstances, a mother with her daughter called and filed a complaint with the police department, and the complaint involved a situation where her daughter was approached by the photographer to be photographed, and the photographer extended an invitation to this young woman's mother to come with her. They went to the studio, photographs were taken, and in the course of that, the mother became concerned over the photographs and some of the photographs that she observed at the photo studio, and then filed a complaint of concern that this was a possible pornographic situation. We investigated it, found the photographer to be, you know, legitimately involved in the photography business, legitimately involved in conducting the photographs, and getting signed releases, and having a photography studio, and so on. The only involvement is that this individual had subleased his studio or apartment from Larry King, and that was the extent of our investigation into pornography-related activities involving Mr. King in any direct way. The Nebraska Foster Care Review Board, which is not a law enforcement agency and is neither equipped to investigate nor prosecute crimes, was in 1988 the default repository of reports of child abuse from children and social workers, all of whom were raising the alarm over the presence of a child exploitation ring that was thriving in Nebraska and trafficking its victims nationally. Executive Director Carol Stitt met with Republican Governor Kay Orr on July 13, 1988, to see if she could intervene at a time when law enforcement refused to investigate the matter any further. Orr told her to, quote, do whatever is necessary to spearhead an investigation. July 20th. Carol Stitt wrote a letter to Attorney General Robert Speyer to request that his office, the state's premier prosecuting body, get involved in the case. Speyer's office gave their cooperation. This marked the first occasion when the testimonies of Nellie Patterson Webb, Loretta Smith, and other child victims of Larry King's illicit activities were conglomerated. From her letter... Pursuant to the Nebraska Child Abuse Statutes, the State Foster Care Review Board is making a report of allegations of a child exploitation ring and respectfully requests an investigation. On May 17, 1988, the Foster Care Review Board received a phone call from Kirsten Hallberg, who is a previous employee of Uda Haley Girls Village and currently works for Richard Young Psychiatric Hospital in Omaha. She was aware of Nellie and her youngest sister Kendra's reports to the review board. Miss Hallberg told me about three Uda Haley girls, a 20-year-old young man at Richard Young and three youths at Boys Town who all reported inappropriate activities with Larry King of Omaha. 
She also reports that at a recent child exploitation conference in Kansas City, a detective from Kansas City asked her when the Nebraska authorities were going to do something about Larry King. On July 20, 1988, Kirsten Hallberg reported a 15-year-old girl at Richard Young who was talking about inappropriate activity with Larry King and also is alleging witnessing a murder of a young boy who said he was going to tell of the abuse he suffered. In addition to the letter, the Foster Care Review Board turned over all their files on the cases to the Attorney General. Spire promised he would do everything in his power to help. He assigned the case to one of his top assistants, him being Bill Howland. Months went by, and little action was carried out by the Attorney General. Carol Stitt and Dennis Carlson demanded a meeting with Howland, which he hosted in his office on November 22, 1988. Carol Stitt described this meeting to the Legislature's Executive Board on December 19, 1988. When Dennis and I were in this meeting, it became clear to me that if Mr. Howland had ever read the materials we delivered to him in July, it was a long time ago, he didn't know major players' names in the case. Dennis did some rather tough questioning, and it became clear to both of us that nothing had occurred. The file was just a mess. I grabbed the file from him, reordered it. Dennis and I both left that meeting. I mean, I can speak for myself. I felt full of despair, and I felt like all the optimism that we had had that something was going to happen to not only help the kids who had been abused, but to stop this from occurring to other kids, and many of the kids that I'm aware of were state wards, was not happening. Nothing was happening. Now we see that we were just being put off. Yeah, we'll get out there, and yeah, we'll do this, and yeah, we're on top of it. But really... None of the officials had organized their investigation. Executive Board member Burl Williams gave his input. I think we became really baffled and puzzled on what was going on when you get all this information in front of you and nothing had or is being done about it. Said Dennis Carlson, I don't know what, if anything, either the Omaha Police Department or the Attorney General's office actually did. If I were doing that investigation, the first thing I would have done with that information is contacted Loretta Smith, who was making allegations that she had witnessed homicides. Not a homicide, but it's homicides. I talked to Loretta Smith's caseworker at Richard Young Hospital on November 22nd. She told me that the last person that interviewed Loretta was Officer Carmian, and that took place on June 28th, 1988. November 30th, 1988, Carol Stitt tried to contact the governor again to set up a meeting, since the Attorney General's investigation made no progress. The governor's office scheduled a meeting for the following week, but canceled it the next day. Typical of the governor's lackadaisical attitude when it came to this case, she assigned investigator Thomas Vlahoulis to the case, and he only worked on it on a part-time basis. On June 22, 1989, the legislature's Franklin Committee found out that he did next to nothing, an excerpt from a transcript of the session. Counsel, as I understand what you told Senator Chambers, the information in your notes, which was important, was placed in the reports that you generated, is that correct? Vlahoulis, yes, it was. Counsel. Now, the conclusion I draw after reviewing that information is that you really didn't do anything between July and late November except to collect some extraneous pieces of information about Mr. King's business interests and perhaps about his wife's citizenship status. That's my conclusion from reading the reports. December 20th, 1988. Attorney General Robert Speyer was quoted in the Lincoln Journal as saying that his office had, quote, acted promptly and professionally on all the, quote, sensitive information 
they received regarding child abuse allegations six months before. Conversely, the Nebraska State Patrol only conducted their first investigative meeting about the case on December 19, 1988, almost down to the minute while Robert Spire was lying about his office's level of commitment to the case. Meanwhile, Carol Stitt and medical personnel who were entrusted with Loretta Smith's care became concerned about her safety. She had been threatened, and with every new charge levied against Larry King, the dangers multiplied. Stitt approached the Douglas County Attorney's Office and requested a protective order for Loretta. The office did file the order. Unfortunately, it stated that Loretta made, quote, bizarre statements that she had been living on the streets for two weeks and was suicidal. Aside from being untrue, these allegations would likely result in Loretta being discredited in court. There were even darker implications. As Senator Chambers observed during Stitt's testimony on December 19, 1988, to the Executive Board of the Legislature, Senator Chambers, Neither you nor Miss Hallberg said that the child is suicidal. Stitt, no. Senator Chambers. But if that's in the court record, in the petition, in official document, and the child winds up deceased, then, and if the result of a suicide, then everybody would have had prior notice that this child is suicidal. If you would, by that report, by that petition, and the court order, now, this is some information that I have, and maybe you don't. Are you aware that Lynn Cernkovich has had information given to her by certain professionals about some of the things that these youngsters have been talking about and making allegations, and she chose to do nothing? Were you aware of her involvement in that regard? Stitt. Yes. I was made aware of that while we were trying to see what we could get done in Omaha. Flahoulis told the Franklin Committee investigators about another occasion when Loretta ran afoul of Cernkovich. According to the exchange between Flahoulis and Cernkovich in January 1989, Father Val Peter of Boystown, quote, had been approached by Loretta Smith and she complained to him that the FBI and Cernkovich had intimidated her to such an extent while she was at Richard Young Hospital that she had not provided them with all the information that she knew. December 19, 1988. At the executive board meeting, Senator Loren Schmidt asked Carol Stitt what effect the mishandling of the case might have on Loretta Smith. Stitt said, I'd like to say if the state continues to handle the case the way they've handled it, everything that this perpetrator has told them is being reinforced that he has the power, there's nothing they can do, nobody's going to help them, and that certainly has been what's happened so far. December 19, 1988. It was the day of the executive board hearing, and Carol Stitt, Dennis Carlson, and Burl Williams of the Foster Care Review Board presented their summary of the abuse complaints made around Larry King. Specifically, they presented their findings on the web home and what was reported by Loretta Smith. Carlson. The nature of these allegations are something that is going to shock the committee. They deal with cult activities. They deal with sacrifices of small children. They deal with sexual abuse. And there's a correlation between these two different reports. We have the Boys Town Report prepared by a worker from Boys Town named Julie Walters, which contains the allegations of the children that were in the Webb foster home, Nellie primarily. Years later, well, two years later, we have Loretta Smith in Richard Young Hospital, who's making allegations against Larry King. And as far as we know, there is no relationship between Nellie and Loretta Smith. Both reports talk about the Omaha Girls Club. Both reports mention a specific individual who is the superintendent of schools, Senator Remmers. The question that came into mind, it's been in my mind since you've been testifying, and I think you've answered part of it just now, 
as you're talking about these abuses from children, from boys' town and girls' club, and so forth. Now, is there a common thread that goes over here to the credit union deal that we are investigating? In other words, to the Franklin Credit Union. Is there a common thread there that kind of leads to that? Carol Stitt. Well, the common thread is Larry King. Senator Remmers. Yes, that's what I mean. It all goes back to him. Okay. Carol Stitt. Yes, he seems to be more the organizer or the high-class pimp. I mean, if that helps fit this together. Stitt also provided clarification about what she wrote in a June 1988 letter to Attorney General Spire about a Kansas City connection of Larry King. She said she cross-checked with this person, a detective, who inquired of Kirsten Hallberg about when Nebraska law enforcement was going to crack down on King. The officer, according to Stitt, quote, confirmed that Larry King had been there, had contributed money to a group home, and when he left, three boys came forward and said that they had been abused by him while he was there. The board also received the handwritten report by Julie Walters on her interviews with the teenaged victims during 1986. Walters did an interview with reporter James Allen Flannery for the Omaha World Herald that was published on December 21, 1988, regarding allegations made by the children. She said that at first their claims seemed, quote, too bizarre to be true, end quote. She went on to say, quote, Working in probation, I'm more sure than ever that there is more truth than not in their accounts. The conclusion I reached was the kids I spoke with were not lying. The senators were considerably disturbed by what they learned at the December 19th meeting. Senator Schmidt said, The information brought tears to my eyes. I do not cry easily, and I was not the only person that was moved. Senator Ernie Chambers was also moved. He said, with this type of information, it is inexcusable that action had not been taken of an investigative nature. People were not contacted that should have been. Leads were not followed up that should have been followed up. My feeling is that the whole thing is being sat upon and nothing was done. The question of a cover-up of the Franklin-linked crimes came up at the get-go. Wadman and Spire protested at the charges. Wadman said in an interview, every step that should have been taken was taken. Spire said, we did receive some sensitive information in July. My office acted promptly and professionally and nothing was sat on. I am confident that law enforcement, both federal and state, is doing its job in the situation. February 1989. The legislature's Franklin Committee hired an investigator, him being Lincoln Police Officer Jerry Lowe. Attorney Kirk Naylor came on board as a special counsel. February 15th, Attorney Lowe sent to the committee his evaluation of the case, including its handling by law enforcement, from his evaluation. This matter is indeed a complex and complicated one commencing with the closing of the Franklin Credit Union and mushrooming into a situation where additional allegations, other than the financial improprieties, have arisen, including influence peddling, child abuse and neglect, child sexual abuse, pornography, substance abuse, homicide, and inaction and possibly malfeasance on the part of law enforcement agencies, public agencies, and public officials for events dating several years back. More importantly, there seems to be a growing public perception that many of the affected agencies and or officials are participating in a cover-up. The task which the committee has undertaken will not be an easy one. The allegations regarding the exploitation of children are indeed disturbing. What appears to be documented cases of child abuse and sexual abuse dating back several years with no enforcement action being taken by the appropriate agencies is on its face mind-boggling. 
Lowe emphasized that the case was heavily connected politically since Larry King had become rich and influential due to his affiliations with powerful people throughout his involvement with the credit union. A private investigator by the name of Gary Caradori conducted videotaped interviews with four of the victims. Over 30 hours of footage was shot from late 1989 to early 1990. Throughout the interviews, he gathered details about sexual abuse, drug use, pornography, and other crimes committed by prominent citizens of Omaha. Noted as abusers and pornographers were the usual suspects, Rusty Nelson, Deward Finch, and of course, Larry King. The information given throughout the interviews became the central data discussed throughout the Franklin case. Aside from a few law enforcement personnel, state senators, and grand jury members, few have seen the tapes. Small samples were reviewed on television. As a result, with so few people having seen the interviews, much debate has gone on about their content. October 30th, 1989. Gary Caradori, flanked by his assistant Karen Ormiston, went to the Women's Reformatory in New York, Nebraska, to interview 21-year-old Alicia Owen. She was serving a sentence for a bad check conviction. She had had run-ins with Larry King's network of child porn peddlers. This is what Caradori documented based on the interview. Ms. Owen was informed of the purpose of our visit and was asked for her cooperation in the matter. Ms. Owen indicated after a three-hour interview that she had been heavily involved with various individuals in Omaha, including former members of the Franklin Credit Union. She indicated that she was also involved with other minors involved in pornography and homosexual acts involving various people in Omaha. Several of the individuals she mentioned were Alan Baer, Harold Anderson, and also former police chief. Robert Wadman, who had participated in many parties. It should be noted that Alicia also indicated that Mr. Wadman is a pedophile. November 4th, 1989. Alicia Owen had more intel for Caradori. From his notes, Upon arriving from out of state on the above date, this writer received word that Alicia Owen had called this writer in an attempt to reach me regarding a meeting that I had conducted with her previously. Upon receiving this information, arrangements were made to speak with Alicia by telephone. Alicia went on to say that she did not relate to me all of her experiences during the first time that we had met because she was unsure of this writer. She stated that she now wanted to come forward with the information that she had previously withheld. Specifically, she indicated that she was one of the minors involved in flights to other states, and she knew of other minors who were on these flights also. November 7th, Caradori and Ormiston went to the Women's Reformatory and conducted a videotaped interview with Alicia Owen, a portion of the transcript. After pursuing many leads on October 30th, 1989, this writer contacted Alicia Owen at the Women's Reformatory in York, Nebraska. I spoke with Alicia for approximately three hours, during which time she indicated that she had been heavily involved in pornographic and sexual activity with various individuals in Omaha, including former personnel of the Franklin Credit Union. During this discussion with Ms. Owen, she initially indicated that homosexual activities also occurred, involving Alan Baer, Harold Anderson, and Robert Wadman. It should be noted that Ms. Owen remitted this information without being directly questioned about these specific individuals. Following is the information gained from Alicia during the videotaped statement of November 7th. During the course of the statement, Alicia stated that she first became involved with Larry King in August of 1983. Alicia was 14 years old at the time. She indicated that she met Larry King through some boys from Boys Town, among them Mark Powers. Mark had invited her to a party that next Friday night. This first party was held in August of 1983 at a Twin Towers penthouse. Alicia arrived with Troy Boner 
and Mark Powers at approximately 10 p.m. in a car that Troy was driving. Present when they arrived at the party were Larry King, Bob Wadman, Alan Bear, Harold Anderson, and other adults that Alicia did not identify at this time. Alicia estimated that there were approximately six adults and 20 minors. Mark Powers had told Alicia prior to going to the party that there would be marijuana, alcohol, and so much cocaine available at this party that, quote, she would think it's snowing. Alicia stated that the party was held at Alfie Allen's apartment in this building. There was a professionally made pornographic tape showing portraying two males, approximately age 17, engaging in homosexual acts. Alicia observed Larry King and Larry, last name unknown, going into one of the bedrooms. She observed later when the black youth emerged from the bedroom that he was tucking in his shirt and fastening his pants. Alicia also observed Alfie Allen going in and out of the bedroom numerous times. She observed a young boy approximately 14 years old sitting on Harold Anderson's lap. She then observed this boy and Harold Anderson going into one of the bedrooms. Alicia observed Alan Bear using two lines of cocaine and smoking marijuana. A young boy was sitting on Harold Anderson's lap with his pants undone. He was stroking the child's penis. The name of the child is unknown. A third party occurred on the 21st or 22nd of September, 1983, at the same Twin Towers apartment. Alicia had turned 15 on September 18th. Present at this party were Troy Boner, Alan Bear, Robert Wadman, Mark Powers, Larry King, Larry, last name unknown, Danny King, and Harold Anderson. Harold Anderson was with Danny King. On the above evening, Robert Wadman told Alicia that she was pretty and asked her if she was wearing anything underneath her clothing. He asked her if she was wearing a bra. Sometime around 10 to 12 p.m., she was sitting on his lap. He indicated to Alicia that he knew she wasn't a virgin, and he then felt her breasts. He told her that she had nice breasts. He felt her genitals and unzipped the zipper to the jumpsuit she was wearing. She asked him to stop, and he grabbed her wrist very tightly and twisted her wrist. He then removed her clothing and asked her if she knew what fellatio was. He said that he would show her what it was. He then instructed her to perform oral sex. Robert Wadman's pants and underwear were down. He pinched her on the breasts. She was kneeling on a cushion on the floor, and he was stroking her hair and her breasts while she was performing oral sex, and he was also grabbing her head and forcing her to perform oral sex on him. After this sexual activity, she began to cry and went to the bathroom, where she vomited. Wadman then told her that he would buy her a new dress. While at the French cafe, Wadman gave her this dress and said that he wanted to show her the wine cellar. She removed her clothing and put on the dress. He said that she would look better without the dress, so she took off the dress and he removed her panties and sat her on top of a table and spread her legs. He then began touching her and she was crying because she was afraid that he would rape her. He masturbated and ejaculated on her. When he ejaculated, she physically drew back, which made Wadman very angry. She stated that during parties, sexual encounters would occur between adult males and minor males. Usually present at these parties were Larry King, Robert Wadman, Jean Mahoney, Alan Bear, Peter Citron, Harold Anderson, and the superintendent of a school. She told me that a photograph was taken of her at a later party while she was tied up. It is probable that the photograph was taken by Rusty Nelson. She describes Rusty Nelson as having blonde hair, average build, approximately 27 years old, and that he has acne scars on his face. Reference group sex. Photos were taken of the group sex encounters by Larry King and the photographer Rusty Nelson. She mentions that her hands were handcuffed and her feet were tied up. She said that Alan Bear cruises the old market area for young boys and then takes them back to his office, where he has them run naked on a treadmill while he watches them. 
This has been corroborated by Troy Boner, who did perform this activity for Alan Bear. She states that she witnessed a young boy sitting on Bob Wadman's lap at a party, and that he had his hands between the boy's legs. She also discussed the activities of Harold Anderson. She said that he likes young boys, and that his regular boy is named Jeremy, last name unknown, and that he was approximately 14 years old when she witnessed them together. She said that Harold Anderson gives money to boys, and that she has seen young boys performing oral sex on him. She stated that she has witnessed Danny King performing oral sex on him. I asked her to elaborate on the superintendent she mentioned as attending the parties. She said that he lives approximately 40 miles from Omaha, is gay, older, balding, has bad teeth, and stands approximately 6 feet. She stated that this individual had sex with Troy Boner at the Twin Towers apartment and that he gave money to Troy for this. Corroboration. You will later see that another witness, Danny King, identifies Deward Finch, former superintendent of the Fort Calhoun High School, as an individual who he had sex with on many occasions. He also fits the description as related by Alicia. Other information from Alicia was that Troy Boner and Danny King were taken to council bluffs by adult males for sexual purposes. Corroboration. Troy Boner and Danny King related these events in detail in their respective videotaped statements. Alicia also describes a forced sexual encounter which occurred at the French Cafe in August of 1985. Present were five boys from Boys Town, Tom McKinney, and Judge Theodore Carlson, among others. Larry told her that someone is waiting downstairs and you'd better be good. She performed oral sex on Judge Carlson, and the encounter lasted approximately 20 minutes. It should be mentioned at this time that the individual identified as Larry, last name unknown, is known as Larry King's henchman. It wasn't unusual for the individuals in this group to divulge their last names, and it was also common to use aliases. Alicia became very upset when discussing her sexual activities with Bob Wadman and with other individuals. The video was stopped several times so that she could compose herself. She said that Wadman had told her that Larry King owes him a lot and that he had done a lot for Larry King. She said that she was told that Omaha Mayor P.J. Morgan supplies a lot of drugs. Alicia took numerous plane trips at the direction of Larry King for sexual purposes. These trips include trips to Los Angeles, Kansas City, Pasadena, California, on these flights were other minors. Information regarding these flights is as follows. Private flights. The first private flight that Alicia was on occurred in March of 1984. The plane landed at a small airport in California. Upon their arrival, Danny and Alicia were taken to an embassy suites type motel, and two businessmen came into their room. One man had sex with Danny, and one man had sex with Alicia. They received no money. She said that Larry King had ordered her to take this trip. The man that Alicia had sex with, she describes as extremely weird. He hurt her, forced her to have anal sex, slapped her, and threw her around. He took out a knife and threatened her if she didn't perform oral sex on him, and threatened to cut off her nipples. She was afraid and crying. She stated that when the men finally left, that they were both very upset. She described Danny as being very upset and angry. Their ordeal with these two men lasted approximately six hours. Also, they were both afraid to take a shower for fear that the men would come back. Corroboration. Troy indicates in his video statement that Alicia, after this ordeal, was extremely upset and smelled and was a mess. When Alicia was asked who participated and who was aware of the transportation of kids across state lines for sexual purposes, she said that Larry King and Alan Bear were aware of this. It is probable that other adults were also aware of this. She stated that Bob Carey knew about these activities and that Larry, last name unknown, had told her this. Larry, last name unknown, also indicated that Bob Carey knew about the closing of the Franklin Credit Union before it fell. 
Other issues discussed regarding Bob Carey consisted of Alicia's statements that she had a friend who works for Dixon and Dixon Law Firm, who is responsible for maintaining the keys to the file room. Her name is Jackie Compton, and she has told Alicia that there are various documents with Bob Carey's signature on them that relate to the Commonwealth ordeal. This is explained in detail in the first videotaped statement. Alicia discusses the friendship between Judge Carlson and Tom McKinney, Assistant Douglas County Attorney. She stated that McKinney and Carlson are also involved in drug activity. She also knows Peggy West, the daughter of Gary West, who is a good friend of Larry King's. She said that Peggy may have also been exploited and or is aware of these activities. She is also acquainted with Gary West and indicated that he is a bartender at the Max Bar in Omaha. When questioned about satanic cult activity, she said that Troy Boner and Danny King were involved in this activity, and that at one time, Danny King was extremely, quote, anti-God. She also mentioned a house on Leavenworth, where there is, or was, a pentagram drawn on the kitchen floor. She also saw satanic pictures on the walls of this house. In addition, she stated that she saw Bob Wadman coming out of this house on one occasion. Corroboration. Loretta Smith mentioned that a person actively involved in cult activity was a male identified as King's Horses. Alicia said that Larry, last name unknown, who was, is Larry King's henchman, is known as King's Horses. She also indicated that she knows an individual identified as James Teddy Broom. She describes him as black, with greasy hair, a flat nose, slitted eyes, and that he walks funny. Said that he does the dirty work for Larry, last name unknown. Corroboration. Loretta indicates that Teddy Broom was instrumental in satanic cult activity and threatened her if she said anything about what happened at the meetings. Loretta Smith also indicated that Teddy Broom raped her mother, Jackie Smith, as a warning to her. She knows an individual named Frank Kessler, who she thought was very strange, and who always talked about the occult, but wanted to get out of it. And that's part one of the Franklin cover-up. Stay tuned for the second part coming soon. Unfortunately, it doesn't get much better than that. Thank you for listening to Human Monsters. Bye for now.